I think it's over there. Good evening. Calling tonight's meeting to order. Um, it is a workshop for Thursday, December 5th. Can I please have the attendance? Yes, Mrs. Durgan. Here. Mrs. Giftos. Here. Dr. Gill. Here. Ms. Casalonis. Here. Ms. Layton. Here. Mrs. Scyther. Here. Mrs. Turner. Here. And we have special. And uh, Kristen. Here. Caldwell. And um, Max Bennett. Here. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and we also have special guests tonight from our building steering committee. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves. Certainly. I'm Andrew Bradley. I'm Kylie Mason. Dana Fortier. Dave Martin. Anne Lovejoy. Awesome. Thank you. And if you could join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Moving in, 4.0 tonight is our workshop. Um, we want to thank you to start with for the Building Steering Committee. Um, you guys have been putting in incredible hours to get to this point of presenting to us your recommendations. And with that, I'm turning the rest of the meeting to you. Sure. Um, Kylie and I are just going to sort of try and split up some of the slides. You don't have to listen to one person drone on. Um, but I've asked the committee members to just pipe up and throw in whenever they hear something that they think should be added or I've left out. And I would ask you to also join in the conversation and let us know when you have a question or a comment or if it's not clear what we're trying to tell you. So with that, let's get going. All right. Our charge, this is just what we're going through. Our charge, who we are, I guess we'll skip that because we already have uh, information we use to derive all this um, recommendation information. Um, what our current issues are in the K through two schools, um, what options we considered for the K through two facilities, um, then our initial recommendations and what we think should be the next steps. So our charge is basically had four basic points. Tonight we'll really only be addressing the first one, which is what are we going to recommend to be built for the city, town. Here's our full list of wonderful people, a few people that were not able to make it tonight. Um, and I will just add that we have been meeting weekly since October, so we have put in a lot of effort here. Um, and I want to thank everybody. I came up with the idea to meet weekly, and um, <laughs> everyone grow. Okay. <laughs> so, so. What we used, um, what we started with was the master plan that the school board commissioned back in probably 2014 um, with an architect to do an overall facility study. Um, what is the status of the three primary schools, uh, included actually some in the middle school, um, Wentworth as well, to determine uh, how to handle increases in enrollment. So they actually went through the physical structure, looking at things like what the buildings were built with, um, what sort of energy efficiency they have, what types of spaces are currently in them, what types of spaces are missing in them. Um, so they've made a, a full master plan, and that was a large part of what we reviewed. Um, a lot of it's very straightforward, uh, has some very compelling information in there. If you haven't reviewed it recently, um, I would suggest you do it. Um, next thing we did was had some of the updated district enrollment data from 2019, which just compounded the information from the master plan. Uh, it showed that there's even a bigger swing trending up than was originally thought back in the 2016 plan. And then as a committee, we went out and looked for some additional information, looking at factors around student success. You know, how would changing a school or moving a school or doing those sorts of things affect student success? Something we wanted to know on our own that was outside of the master plan. And then we looked to committee members from the schools, the three primary school principals, uh, to hear from them how their spaces are being used um, and what is appropriate or inappropriate for their student body. So one of the things that stood out um, and I think stands out really well on this slide is how deficient we are in some of our spaces. And when you look at how we stand uh, to DOE standards, while we all love our primary schools as they are, kids have gone through them, uh, we've had great experiences, one of the things that stands out the most is we're below standard in the sizes of our kindergarten classrooms, our first and second grade classrooms, our art room, but most importantly in these shared spaces like the gym and cafeteria. Uh, we depend on these for our lunches, for the you know, for the gym time, and let's just talk about um, rain days or when we can't go outside. Um, it just makes that an even more compounded program or problem. And when you think about what that means, this is based on two seatings. If we were to increase one seating uh, for the lunch program, we lose 50% of our PE uh, 
time. And that's a big impact to our students. Yeah. Um, yes, this one here. So one of the things, we, there's a lot on this slide, and you can read it just as well as I can read it to you. But a couple of things that stand out the most here is that it really asks, what kind of district do we want to be? And there's obviously the legal implications of our spatial requirements, but there's also the societal implications. And what we're asking is our vulnerable students, all of our students, to do their learning out in a hallway, to learn their core curriculum out where the public is. People passing by, people waiting to go to the restroom, people going on, on their way to lunch. And we're asking them to do their, their most intense learning in this public space. And so in addition to that, we have these, you know, we're sharing art and music. We have no space for adult uh, meetings. So when you think about our principal um, and, and the teachers trying to meet on kid chairs in the library and still not have enough space to hold a meeting to teach our students what we need, um, that really stands out. Yeah, I mean, my son went through uh, schools and needed quite a few IEP meetings. Um, and there are a lot of people involved. Uh, and the thought of having to do that in an open library on a very sensitive subject of my child's future um, is a hard thing to ask someone else to do. I think that's one of the things we need to think about as well. And you know, one thing that's on here, STEAM, I, you know, when I first saw that brought up, I sort of thought, oh, it's a high school subject. That's not a thing. But I realized it's really a fundamental here. I'm talking about building blocks at the primary level. And that's when it's missing, it's a gap that just kind of adds on over time. And I think if we talk about safety and security, we can talk about the inside of the building. Um, we can talk about cameras and technology and all the things we do to add our, you know, to make our schools more safe. Um, but for me, from a site perspective, I think about there is no fire lane around any of our schools at a primary level. And what that means is that in the event of emergency, there's one point of entry, which means they can't get their vehicles behind the school to help our students. That's a big deal. Um, and you know, to that, there's also there's no drop off, there's no pickup area for parents to, to drop their kids off at school. But going inside the building, you think about none of the doors are opening the right way for an emergency situation. They have to be locked from the outside. And when you think about securing in place, we're talking about somebody has to go through and lock those doors from the outside. That's not good for our students. Even the windows, they're and not the windows they're not operable right. enough for anyone to get out. Yeah, I think one of the other key areas as well is that we're taking up so much space in other areas with programs, so hallway space uh, is being used, and you know, that does uh, impede and complicate an exit path situation in the event of emergency. So, um, definitely from a code perspective, it's, it's uh, something that's a challenge. So, this wow. is oh no, you guys can't even see it. Um, this is, um, you have, if you haven't seen it, you almost want to turn around. <laughs> Somebody help, you can show up. I don't know. So if you haven't it's seen it, there's a graphic that shows our existing schools, the modulars or portables um, or temporary structures that are currently on the site and how many we're going to need uh, to address enrollment. And one of the things uh, for me wasn't as powerful as it was for other people because one of the things I thought was lacking is it doesn't show what it means in relationship to our sites. There isn't enough space to put all of these temporary buildings that we're saying we're going to need, which doesn't resolve any of the demands we've talked about in terms of what kind of district do we want to be and what kind of education do we want to provide our students. Spatially, we can't fit it. So this is something that, while it's temporary, it's still, it's not even a good temporary solution. This is probably ineffectual. <laughs> <laughs> but we really so, want you to see yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, this, and this graphic came straight from the master plan. It's just really talking about the additional space required for temporary structures. This is how ineffective it is. <laughs> yeah, that's show. It's embarrassing. I, I think we also had a, a, an updated version of that graphic when we presented the first portables oh. presentation, as I recall. So, yeah, we've seen it. Yeah. Oh, good. good. So you know what we're talking about. Chris. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. It was, it was oh maybe it was on the timer. Uh, uh. So, uh, Wait, can you go back? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Technology, it works. All right, so um, the next one. Sorry, Kylie. The site. What's the time horizon on the, um, the 15 temporary classrooms? The timeline? Uh, so that's actually, I think, up to 2025, right? 
So the full right. build out would be 2025 okay. for all of these modulars. And there's a, a great fact that, and you'll see it later on, but if you take one thing away from this, if we kept going with this temporary construction, 45% of our students would be in temporary modular classrooms by 2025. That's, and that's only if we have the space for it, which we actually right. don't. Right. right. So maybe we stack them like cargo boxes. <laughs> I don't think that meets code. But um, so then getting into site constraints, which is the next slide, I wanted to use this, uh, this example. This is Pleasant Hill site. And what stood out most to me is this, for me, documents the issue that we're looking at here. So you have this site at Pleasant Hill. It's a great local school, small neighborhood community school. And then think about how much parking we need to put on there to meet demand. And look how very little open space our kids have. So we're talking about a playground that's severely constrained by a building and a parking lot on one side. Uh, it's probably a fraction of what's available to them right now. But there's zero lot line buffer. It means that the, the residential neighbors are looking right into the school ground. The school ground's looking right into the residential neighborhood. Maybe not so bad for Pleasant Hill, but now think about eight corners. It's surrounded entirely by commercial development. So now imagine your kids on a reduced playground looking at the back of Shaw's. Right. And the other thing here to note is the new space is actually a, a multi-story, <laughs> two-story building. Even closer. <laughs> right, and the, that big point is that this that blue structure is two stories. Um, and we still aren't solving our safety and security issues. There's still no opportunity for a fire lane. Um, and there's no pedestrian vehicular circulation, right. no way improve. to get in. Is that parking lot the existing parking lot at Pleasant sort of Hill? Or? Diagram. Right, no. down at the bottom is. I'll do this one. Oh, there you go. Oh, no, it doesn't work on, work on TVs. TVs. But this All layout that. is what just sort of a reconfigured new in this gray area. Yeah. That's, that's, okay. that's, that's, the, that's all it's there now. And so you would be removing the the play space to make the parking right trees play space everything right. <laughs> maybe we can play some four square four no cars <laughs> there is some small amount of um play space planned in this right. diagram but when you look at that zero lot lane buffer all of a sudden it becomes very clear how little space mm -hmm. we have left you know, one of the issues too uh, touching on what tyler was saying with the two-story addition is that um Kindergartners through and first graders, or if they were to be, you know, well, kindergartners and first graders both cannot be in classrooms on a second level. So it's not like we could, you know, shrink down the footprint and go to a three or four story, you know, addition. It just wouldn't work out programmatically because of the classroom space issues. So, <coughs> just, just yes. to be clear, that's that's a state law. Right. Yes. This is not like we have decided as a community no. that this is an appropriate. That's Correct. a state law. Yes. Okay. So, with that information, so we sort of looked at options, and I thought we'd start with where we are now, sort of status quo. And our current approach is the use of temporary classroom space modulars or portables, whatever you like to use them for. Um, it's a quick fix, and it, you know, there's a lot of things it says here. Um, buys us time. Does keep the schools in the neighborhoods. Um, but there are issues that we've already covered. There's not enough land to keep going in this path. Um, it doesn't get us any new um, common or shared space. So every time we're adding children, the ratio of child to library or cafeteria or gym space, that goes down. Um, it doesn't address really any of the safety concerns. And in fact, we were talking about this maybe causes more because now you have lots of decentralized pods of classrooms away from central services like the front office. Um, and sort of, to me, when I drive by a modular classroom, classroom on the site are beautiful ones at eight corners. It reminds me of when I go to a job site. This is what the contractors often put up. They're meant to be a uh, temporary tenure. They move from site to site, but they're not, their lifespan is not meant to be the same lifespan as a permanent school structure. And I think one of the things, um, and I'm not being flipped by it, but I, with kindergartners, do they, are they <coughs> transferred into the lunchroom or do they eat lunch in the classroom? No, they go to the lunch right now. Because one of the things that I had always thought was so odd is that now we have a lot of little schools, one room classrooms or one room schoolhouses on a school campus. So we have lots of little itty bitty schools, I guess. Oh, almost, yeah. Um, with the which is buildings. just a ter it just kind of further compounds this terrible idea of separating our students from other students and having this really well, 
pregnant. And not to interrupt, but just that uh, 45%. I mean, 38% of my students are in portable buildings right now in homerooms, and should two more classes move out into the, the new portables that are just opening, it'll be 53% of my staff, my students will be in portable structures. They have been for since 2002, so. Right, come to Just because they didn't look lives. like portables doesn't mean they weren't portable. <laughs> right. yep. Still a short lifespan. Yeah, right. So, we sort of consider this just a review of status quo, not really an option for the future. And that really leaves us with two options. One is a major renovation and expansion of the existing school buildings. Um, one of the primary things that comes to me as a, as a structural engineer thinking about constructability is there's gonna be a, an enormous amount of phasing here. So that means we're gonna have an extended construction period where we have children learning in one room and contractors building buildings on the other side of the wall. Um, it's not a great learning environment, as well as it's going to be more I think, in my opinion, more expensive and much, definitely much more time required. It's, a, it's tremendously more expensive. I, uh, I work in, I work for Ivex Laboratories and we have to do phase construction all the time and we have no choice in op operating laboratories. But we find that it adds between 60 and 80 percent cost to our project. So a significant amount of money to, you know, create a temporary space, have someone, you know, move into that temporary space so that you can work on another area. Um, it's very disruptive, and it does pose safety and security issues having an active work site in a school. Um, so that's something that would be, uh, you know, would be a challenge for this option. Um, none of it is insurmountable, but it's definitely adds a significant amount of cost, time, and complexity to the project. And just to pile on, it, one of the things it doesn't do is it still doesn't address substandard classroom sizes. It doesn't address our programmatic needs, but from a site perspective, um, again, we still don't have this benefit of safety and security around the building, but our playground in that transitional time period is literally a construction zone. And so I have school projects where they're trying to do this right now, and imagine a chain link fence separating our children from earthwork machines. This is not where kids should be playing. Um, and I think that's really important because construction doesn't stop when the kids show up construction keeps going so i think that's an interesting point too you know thinking about the extended timeline you know a whole <laughs> series of class class of k through tours will go through an entire right, career entire. there at the construction site via one year issue um it does you know as you said there are negatives there are some pluses here i mean we should talk about them it does uh, allow the ability to Put the classrooms in space it does allow to get more functional shared spaces um, so there are some pros right but as many as i think we feel there are cons so that leaves the other the second option which is building a new consolidated school um, you know really in this option as a designer um, it's a free hand you know, all the things we've been talking about is needing to help the student success um, are available to us because we can reprogram the space. We have a blank slate. We don't have to worry about starting with a confined area. We can use whatever we need from the tools of today's best practices and design to uh, enhance the student environment. So we can address the safety concerns. Uh, we can get right sized classrooms. We can address the lack of STEM. Uh, we can provide spaces for um, extra educational space like IEPs as well as teacher space for professional moments, um, as well as art and music, things that are undersized or lacking in other buildings. And I guess the last thing there is maybe the, a big one also, it realizes a lot of operational efficiencies. Um, and to that point, there's we have a slide in here uh, talking about operational costs of the various schools in the district. Um, <coughs> the three elementary K-2 K schools are at the bottom there. You can see about $6 a square foot. Um, and comparing that to the Wentworth, um, with the additional benefit of having air conditioning, you know, there's almost a two to one factor there between what's being spent per square foot to operate the K to two buildings versus the Wentworth. So I mean, there is a, an effic efficiency of the building in terms of not just space, but also of construction types. You know, um, we can talk about sustainability, green, and those sort of things that can be realized with this sort of construction, but just operation with dollars, there's some avoided cost along the way. Um, another thing to think about here is, <coughs> excuse me, 
the age of the existing structures. Um, they're 50 years old in that range. Um, much of them have aging systems, uh, which are more prone to needing repair. So there's a lot more. Um, that's probably a lot of what the $6 versus $3 factor is about. Um, and I think that's one of the things to think about as we keep in those buildings sort of doing the status quo, we don't address those sort of functional deficits, the aging systems which are past their functional lives. As a structural engineer or as in the design community, 50 years is a significantly long building life. Um, I would say that it has served us well and has met its design need with the 50 year standing. I think one other, uh, one other fact though is, is in the event we said, okay, well let's renovate the existing schools. So these numbers are in, in current state Renovated schools would be an improvement over what we see mm -hmm. there, the six dollars a square foot. Um, but it would not be. You know, you're still going to have the, the building infrastructure itself, the actual structural components, the roofs, the walls. Um, right. There are limited things that can be done to improve that. But you will never get to the efficiency that you get with new construction, and you're also really limited in what you can do in terms of layout because you you have an existing building. <coughs> you become very we'll constrained in, in what you're able to do. We'll have sort of the New England Rambler schoolhouse. <laughs> so if you, in, in, in trying to assess the cost of renovation versus, for operations and maintenance, renovations versus consolidation, if you, you know, if you took off some amount per square foot for renovation, it would it be the, the net of all three schools versus the new cost of, so then you bring it down to the Wentworth as a consolidated so would it be like $18 a square foot versus three or well, four or five or is so since it's by square foot it, it, would, it, would, average yeah. it, would, average it would average out it would average out okay thank you for being the math person <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things also sort of on that point about square footage one of the things that 2016 um, plan talked about was the ability to reduce actual <coughs> square footage because of the inefficiency of renovation. And so looking at the total square footage of renovated, uh, expanded K-2 building, three buildings, versus the consolidated, they projected something on the order of 30,000 square feet saved. Um, it's not an apples to apples comparison. The report was not quite exactly what we're talking about here, but I think the point is still valid, is that when you have one building, you can find efficiency in square footage. So. You know, maybe we're aiming at that three dollars a square foot, but at the same time, we're aiming at less square feet. Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of the takeaway there. <coughs> so, and I guess this last point is maybe a little more touchy feely. Um, as an engineer, I like hard data. Um, when we went out and started looking in the <coughs> interwebs for other research, other districts have gone through this work before, thinking about what makes a good school a good school. Um, so we were sort of concerned, not concerned, we are concerned about student success. And when I was reading through the master plan, it really talked about facility, it really talked about dollars. And what was missing to me, my wife's an educator, um, what was missing to me was the comments about student success rates and what was this going to do to actual thriving students. Um, and so there has been some concern about, you know, is a neighborhood school better or is this big school too big? And so we went out looking for, see if we could find some answers. Um, I think we found a few things. The biggest thing that we found was classroom size is really the biggest determiner of success. Um, socioeconomic status in the community is a big one. Um, overall school size seemed to be only reflected in overall attendance rates. So the idea being if you take three schools, you put them together, suddenly a whole bunch of kids stop showing up because no one's noticing. That's the, the negative, that's the idea. Um, but we have some really good examples of was it four, four of the top five performing schools in the region? These numbers are, you know, this consolidated school idea would not be as large as Falmouth, um, but it would be in sort of that range. And these are super performing schools. I mean, we looked sort of at what the attendance rates were, went with, we didn't see any appreciable loss or, or um, difference in attendance rates because it was a larger school. Outside we, we didn't put this on the slide, but we did look at the attendance rates of all six schools in the district, and there's no difference. Actually, there is at Eight Corners has a lower attendance rate, but there's no there's no lower attendance rate at our Wentworth School, Middle School, or High School, which all have a, a significantly larger population than there are at the primary schools. And I think one of the things that's really interesting to know is frame of reference. You know, we looked at these 
these studies, white papers, large men, thousands. Uh, when they said small, they meant 500. So, you know, there's always a range, and not every study said the same thing, large right. and small. But as we're thinking large, other districts are thinking that's a small. So it's just a sort of a frame of reference thing to keep in mind. Right. And I think what's important, too, is that these point out, I mean, we don't even have to look further than Scarborough-Wentworth to see success in consolidating and having a large school of elementary students. Who doesn't love Wentworth, right? Our kids are thriving there. But beyond that, the other three schools that we have on here are K through five or K through three. So we're talking about primary, our primary kids going to a school of the same size and having that same success rate. So I think within our region, we don't even need to go on a national standard or a national study. We can see it right here within the surrounding communities. It works. So I think you can guess what our recommendation is. Um, we all really feel strongly that a primary consolidated primary school is the best environment for student success. Uh, it addresses all the inadequacies that are currently happening. Um, a lot of the inadequ uh, inadequacies that really can't be well solved through uh, modular or through renovation. Um, I guess the other thing is it does offer, you know, sort of looking at the slide before with the K through three, K through five, it does offer us the opportunity to mitigate overcrowding at some of the other schools. Um, so, additionally, we're hoping we can push you a little bit here and ask or suggest that you uh, send out the request for qualifications, RFQ. Um, it is required that it be advertised so looking for designers. Uh, this is not a line in the sand that things will be built after this is put on the street, but this is just to get the right people in the right place. Um, and we'd like to make sure that in that process, um, we're pushing those people who respond to look at the idea of bringing in um, additional program that can help solve and mitigate problems, say like that. And I think what's important here is that we can do this advertisement and we can interview <coughs> for consultants concurrently with, with any decision you need to make in terms of what we decide to move forward with. So your decision does not predicate if we can go out for our RFQ or not. We can go ahead and, and start that process now because there is some time involved <coughs> to send out the advertisement time to ask them to respond, and then time to evaluate the proposals. And I think that can happen concurrently with your decision-making process. To that end. Um, so <coughs> there's sort of an overview of what we think the timeline is going to look like. Um, we were simplified. Talking, simplified. <laughs> um, looking at this as a designer, this is not a very long <laughs> schedule, but this is not an undoable schedule. Um, I guess, like I say, the luxury of time is not with us any longer. Um, if we would like to try and be effective at this approach. Um, so you can see here the milestones. We're hoping that in December of this year we can publish, advertise for the RFQ. Um, beginning of January, we hope you vote on this recommendation. And then in February, we can look for the short list of people who've responded and find our favorite Pikachu, Pikachu designer. Um, after that, subcommittees, design, building design is probably a very familiar process after the Wentworth. Um, then July to August, hopefully school board's final approval, and then town councils for the referendum, and then sending it to the townspeople for vote in November. I think Andrew is probably going to say this, but I'm going to jump in front of him. But as designers, I think we could all agree this is a, I'm just going to call it energetic and not <laughs> aggressive. Um, but this is an energetic timeline. There is not going to be time um, for um, pause. Um, we need to ask our consultants to stay on it and stay focused on it. But that also requires decisive action on our part as a committee and as, as a board of education. Um, we need decisive um, action. We need to make sure that everyone's informed. It'll be a large engagement process, uh, and that will be what makes us successful. So just one quick quick point of clarification. So I, definitely it's an advanced, uh, uh, fast timeline. It's, it's accelerated, certainly. But I don't believe, and I'd like the committee's opinion on this, that that doesn't sacrifice any of the due process that no. we owe our community right. in it's making this type of decision. You're not rushing right. through it. Again, it's energetic, um, and it just requires focus and dedication. Um, so you wouldn't be cutting any steps. You're not skipping through anything. Um, but you are paying attention, and you're doing it Decisive. Proactive. Proactive is a good word. Yes, ma'am.
can you talk a little bit more about uh, the RFQ and how, so I've been, I'm on the committee, you guys all know that, um, but just for anyone who's watching, um, Alicia and I are both uh, members of the committee and um, as I'm talking with people, there's a, um, there's a real confusion about what an RFQ is. Sure. I think because people in the business world think that that's like, oh, you're going out with a design and you're getting a cost back and this is a proposal and, and like that's really jumping ahead because the board hasn't even made a decision. So I'm just wondering if you can um, go over a little bit more sure. closely what that is and what the process is and why you think that we can do it concurrently? Sure. So just to clarify, uh, request for qualifications, what we're literally asking for is we're asking for consultants to tell us why they're qualified to help us with this project. There is no design that comes after they've been contracted, after we make a decision on what on what we're doing, but then after all of that program <coughs> and design. So sometime between mm. March and July is when we're finally going to say, okay, now let's get going on the design. The proposal um, to build the school doesn't come till after the referendum. Um, but the design work does start its process in March and through July, and that's at what we would call a very schematic level. Um, I would say probably just enough to get us to a cost estimate exactly. that we can put on the referendum. That's because true. you can't design it until we vote on it. Right. There needs to be a lot of time spent in looking at the program, coming up with the site, understanding those things, um, so we can get realistic numbers in front of the council about good set of design guidelines without a good set of uh, programmatic research into what goes on in schools and what we want and the exploration into which grades would be served. Um, we can't get a good reasonable number. You know, we've always read about projects that go over budget. You know, one of the problems with projects going over budget is not giving enough information ahead of time to develop a good budget. And so we want to make sure that we leave enough time in the schedule for respondents to the RFQ to do that process. And the reason that's not a proposal right now, so the difference between a request for qualifications and a request for a proposal, is that we don't have anything for them to give us a proposal on. Right? We're still asking you uh, if we want to go for a consolidated school or a renovated school. But more importantly, through the BGS, so Bureau of General Services, their standard is that you choose your designer based on their qualifications, not on the price they give you. And that's very important because we're not asking for the cheapest doesn't mean we're not looking for a value, but what we're asking for is we want to know that they're qualified to do this work first, and then we negotiate yeah, what the cost of our, our projects there, There's an important factor here that, that may not be clear to everyone is you know, the, the process that we'll, where we are now <coughs> is in, in the stage of deciding what we're going to do, and then we need someone to help come in and do the design work. That's what this RFQ is going to help to engage. So we're going to engage someone to help us actually design the school. The second step after the design is done and we have the preliminary cost from the engineer and the architect would be to put that out for bid to a construction company to actually get the price to build somebody. Um, that's that's way down the road. Um, so a lot of people think like, well, RFQ, you can get, get a price to build a school or get a price to build something. No, this is. This is just to evaluate who can design it, who can help us work the design process. Just to jump on that a little bit more. Um, so what's in an RFQ might be one of the questions you guys have as well. Basically, all we're seeking are, is like, they, like everybody's mentioned, nothing monetary whatsoever, no fee proposal. Purely just looking to designers, architectural designers to <laughs> assemble a team, so to assemble <laughs> engineers, the mechanical, electrical, structural, everybody, and propose a team together and just present everyone's qualifications based on their design firm experience and their own personal experience in terms of who would be, who would they be presenting to work on this project should they be selected. So there, and it's our chance, um, the way we, we write the RFQ, we have written the draft of the RFQ, and we write it um, specific to what we're hoping to hear. So we, we want to hear you know, specifically, you know, how are they, how would they address a, you know, the K through two type of, of building um, and some of the, the site restrictions that we may have or you know, any sort of thing like that. You know, we, we want some, you know, sustainable building. So, you know, how would they go about, you know, what's, what's their plan of action for all these different design aspects? So that we can, that they have working on these kinds of projects, specifically 
Exactly. Maybe some more mundane things like, how many times did you finish on time? <laughs> right. So, yeah, so it's our chance to really just see that we are, so, are selecting a design team uh, and we, could, we would short, you know, bring it down to a short list so we would actually interview, you know, however many, three or whatever. Um, and you get a chance to talk to them in person and ask specific questions. But it's really just a chance for the town and everyone to really just get to bring it down, bring in a design team ultimately that would go and um, put together a fee proposal from there. Right. And I think the most important piece for us and why we can do it concurrently is this is in line with the state guidelines. So if you were a state funded project, this is how they would ask you to go through it. Even if you aren't a state funded project, this is how they're going to ask you to go through it. And that just assures that we're all doing things the way they should be, that no one's doing it in a unique way. So we have that assurance as well. And I think the other thing, just from my perspective, the other reason that um, we, it can work concurrently is because we, we have the draft that we have written is written um, not for a specific project. So um, the fact that the board hasn't decided yet um, and hasn't voted yet on how to move forward with this um, is OK, because the RFQ is written to just be kind of like a project in Scarborough having to do with the K-2 schools. Um, and conversely, if something were to happen, I mean, if we decide to do nothing, then there's, you know, the only thing we've lost is the um, advertisement that we put in to, to have the RFQ put out. And the time of getting all those packages. And the time <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to interrupt April. I know she had a oh, question. Go ahead. Um, I have two questions for you guys. Was the <clears throat> vote to make this recommendation among your committee, was that unanimous? Yes. It was. It was. Okay. Um, and then just back to the modular component, and you might have had this, or, and if you don't have this data, we can follow up on it. Um, but at, at some point, we're going to run out of space. You said, do you know what year that is, like I said. Because 2025. Well, 2025 well, is when that we space. When we run out of space. Because my context for that is, even if we said yes today, the school's not going to be here right. for a That's couple right. of years, right? So we're That's likely really going to have to do these things. Valid question. In, in parallel. So. Um, I don't know that we are prepared to answer it right now, but we can okay. probably find out spatially how many of these modulars can we fit on the sites and what would that look like. Uh, I mean, I think projection. I would think they'd have three answers. Right. You know, because the schools have different shapes, they have different mm. sight lines, right. um, and different <laughs> drop-off points. So right. trying to squeeze them in would have they wouldn't all be say four or five. You know, one would be one, one would be three, whatever it is. Fair enough. Well, and, and some of these conversations we've had on long-range planning and, and beyond the ones that we have budgeted currently, which are a couple more at Eight Corners and then two potential ones at Pleasant Hill, anything we add beyond that that we can possibly find space for requires significant <coughs> site work to bring up to, to line. So to fill in all those black squares that are up there with the sites that we have is probably not, not only is it not feasible, it's most likely not possible. To kind of, sorry, my voice is terrible. To go back for just a second to what Sarah had just asked, um, can you guys speak a little bit to the article that was printed in the paper? Because the article did not say that the vote was unanimous. And so oh. we have conflicting information being circulated. And I just want to make sure that I'm saying the right thing and representing you guys appropriately. Sure. I mean, we've been meeting since October. and. We weren't, weren't a homogenous block, sure. and we've had some discussions that were relatively heated at times. Um, <coughs> have things they think are more important than others, but I think in the end, um, I, I personally embrace that. I like that conflict because knowing, you know, we're a cross section of the town, and so there's going to be people in our committee that have the same response that the town's going to have. And I think, among ourselves, we came to that same decision together after all those meetings. Okay, and I think that helps me feel that this is a good response. It was unanimous. Um, it was misreported. There was um, uh, an individual who participated on the phone and, and expressed some of the concerns that we all debated, you know, and um, but ultimately that individual did vote in support um, and it was unanimous. I mean, largely that person who was on the phone 
for these two slides. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then my next question is kind of a high-level question, but at what point do we start talking about where? And I know that you kind of all touched on that, but I feel like a, a large portion of the buy-in for the community is, and, and maybe even for the board, um, is going to be about where. Um, and so from your timeline, I kind of get the impression that First, we need to decide what our consolidated school is going to look like. But then I also kind of want to know like what the timeline is for develop for mm -hmm. maybe choosing sites and and really what where these where this could even be where where what April, is feasible. Can I just jump in. So it has to be. We have to vote first to have a consolidated school. So part of the <laughs> vote for part of the referendum will not be a location. Yes, part of the referendum will, when we get to November. Yes. Will the referendum the will. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I knew that yes. wasn't happening for us in January. Sorry. Oh, I, I literally sorry. meant, I like, looking sorry. forward. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. No, that, yeah. I just didn't want to misunderstand that, nope. like, we, right. have a, we have a decision to make yes. before any yes. site planning can happen. Okay. To, yes. be, to be clear, um, so you can, you can start the discussions as, <clears throat> as soon as you vote um, which way you want to go. And I think there's a couple of different discussions that have to happen. We have to have discussions um, with you. We have to have discussions as a community as to what's available. But then we're going to lean on our consultants to help really program what we need and how much space we need. So we have a general idea, but right here in this March to July timeframe, you're going to have uh, your engineers or site consultants uh, working with the committee and, and the town to identify what sites are available and can they support what we're designing. Um, with that come a number of things. Um, there need to be uh, some, some surveys done. We need to check for environmental constraints. Um, and all of that goes into making sure that the school, uh, should we go that way, um, could fit on the site we're choosing for it. So the worst thing to do would be to pick a five acre site and need a 10 acre building. Is a terrible idea, but um, <laughs> so, but you know, you can understand the logistics if you pick a site that's entirely wetland and you don't know that till after the referendum. Oops. Monetary. So they, they're going to flush all of that out. The, the thing that we vote on in November will be site specific, site specific, and tested to make sure that we know what's on it. At any point, do we as a board then like will that be an action item that will come to us? in terms of where? Like, what if there's some competing ideas about where the school goes? Like, how will... I can, I can actually address, as part of the public process that goes through um, the design, with the designers, you'll actually have uh, an opportunity to engage the community. Um, and what I would probably suggest is when we get there, we consider a straw poll to understand support. But largely, um, the availability of land will be dependent on the community and on the town um, and whether it is owned and available. I don't know if that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, there is a there is a final approval by the school board for um, for the the design and including the site. Um, and I mean, that's something that you would be updated on. But I think Kylie's point is, I don't think we're going to have 20 choices of sites. Right. <laughs> but we may have two. We might have two. <laughs> if, maybe. Nice one third. Okay, we might have three. That would be what? ideal. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know. So, so the reason I ask is obviously because I just want to know, like, at what, you know, to what level does this responsibility fall to the committee and, and how frequently does the committee need authorization from the school board and you know how will we be able to make those kind of decisions and you know will it be things like polls or you know are we gonna will it be cost or will it be you know like what are our, our driving decision factors I guess I would think that you could have an informational update as the steering committee and the consultants are moving through um, Certainly, there's going to be programming discussions just for informational purposes. Um, if we are lucky enough to have multiple sites to choose from, that would be a perfect opportunity to come and do some information sharing and to, and to gather information. Great. Thank you. From your perspective and, and after doing this type of work, is, is there, um, other than seeking um, public input, 
are there other things that the board should be doing before the vote on January 2nd? There actually, we do have one more slide, but I don't know if it got, oh. if it made it to this. But we did have some additional um, recommendations. And one of them was to open up the schools um, for the public to see, um, similar to what was done with public safety. Come and look at what we have. Come and look at all of the schools um, and, and see what we're talking about. Um, just to get a, a framework for what we're, what we're discussing and what, where we want to go. Um, I think sometimes the, the greatest evidence of what we're talking about is to let people see it with their own eyes. Um, I don't know. I might have it on mine. Yeah. Sorry. And there, the research is in the shared drive, and so is the um, facilities master plan and the enrollment studies. And I know that I think you have most of that anyways, but but um, those are, yeah, that's information obviously you want to look at. I think one thing that, I know we touched on it, but one thing I think this committee would like to ask the board to consider is that um, you consider in your in your deliberations and ultimately in your vote that this building project find a way to add relief to overcrowding at the middle school, um, that we somehow can can actually kind of dual purpose um, what we're trying to do and add value. Um, we have the opportunity here to not just fix our primary schools, but to add relief to some of our other buildings. I think that's also an important point in terms of talk about the um, siting of the school size and the programming. Those are very key elements for us to be able to when we engage the designer, those are things that will need to be known um, yeah. in order for us to be successful in carrying out the design in a reasonable period of time. I think that, like, the, oh, sorry, Chris. Okay. Um, can you kind of explain more about how it would help the middle school with, like, those headaches? Well, actually, that's kind of what I was going <laughs> to yeah. I can sort of speak that a little bit. I think, so um, this committee's charge, if you go back to the very first slide, was very specific to... Um, <coughs> to look at the K-2 level. Um, so, you know, we all saw the potential for being able to um, shift grades around and maybe alleviate some of the overcrowding at the middle school by moving sixth grade out and all of these other things. But because our charge was very specific to K-2, we didn't go down that path. And I think what um, that last slide said is that we're, we're recommending um, in addition to like, you know, the recommendation to have a consolidated school and to, here's the timeline, and to publish the RFQ and to um, open up the schools for the public to see. We're also recommending that the board, as we make this decision be before January, think um, hard about whether we want to um, change the, look globally at the district and see if we can change this slightly um, to try and mitigate some of those issues. One of the options that's championed <clears throat> in the facilities master plan, actually two of them, uh, do exactly that. They do some phase shifting and they actually move um, K3 to the hypothetical. <clears throat> yeah, I think I'm catching whatever you're doing. Um, <clears throat> move K3 to the, to the lowest, um, to our youngest group of students. And then you go to four, six for Wentworth and you have seven and eight alone at the middle school. And that would allow us to get rid of our whole grade that lives in the satellite uh, temporary school. <laughs> that was a nice way of saying that. That's nice. So, the, I mean, during those discussions, it got to be really overwhelming because we were <coughs> talking about renovations and consolidations and the grades and what that means. And, and so if, if we're to now look at that from a board level, um, makes me wonder when that conversation is appropriate and and how we go about it. I mean, is that a conversation to have with the architects at, at that level? And I would think that the RFQ can be a little bit ambivalent about what grades it is. Okay. Um, but once they're selected, they're going to be looking for their charge. They're going to want to yeah. know what you want. And at that point is when we need to have that answer. So that it's gets a conversation that I think needs to happen now. Okay. That yeah. Needs to happen. And this, the happen. decision doesn't need to be now. You have time. But I think by the time we're selecting an architect, you we want to know that answer. Okay. So is that a conversation that occurs in long range planning or where, how and then long range planning makes a recommendation or how how do we tackle that? In the way that 
Oh, sorry. I was going to say, for me, the way I've been thinking about this in listening, and there has been so much research, it's evident. Um, I think that's part of that conversation for when we go to take the vote. And it may be that we are charged as board members to go back, review the information that you have seen, um, the, uh, go back through the master plan and really look at what their recommendations were as well, and be prepared to have that open conversation after the public forum on the 19th. Um, that information is all public, so the community can look at it as well, um, as far as the master plan, and really be able to have um, a, a solid understanding. I have a gut feeling of where I would land on it, but I really need to spend some more time analyzing all the information to know that I'm doing it with data and not just on an emotion. I agree with Leanne. I think that you know the good thing about this is a lot of these answers and a lot of the information that can underlie, I think, our opinion exists. It's just a matter of refamiliarizing ourselves with it as a board through the lens of what we know now and where we're headed, um, most likely depending on what we recommend, what we decide, of course. Um, but I, we're not starting over, so I think that's a good thing. I think the amount of work is actually small. Agreed. Just to be clear, though, I think you guys are asking for a decision from us tonight on whether or not to go out with RFQs. Correct. Yes. Okay. If we can so do that, is I was going to say okay. for um, the RFQ, it sounded as though we didn't have to say it is absolutely going to be, you know, X to Z as far as grade levels. It's right. yes, you can go to that, you know, the qualification point. Um, it's very non-specific. Yeah. To be honest. And well, and in fact, it's not even. Um, renovation versus consolidation right. specific in the RFQ either, no, let I mean, alone grade levels. It's really like asking people to give us their resume and references. Basically. And, and a lot of the information is, you know, what have you done? And you, and, and you can look it over. I can send it. It's right, it's right now. It's being vetted by the lawyers right now. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's only, it's like six or seven pages. It's not like overly crazy. It's not super technical. I mean, it's pretty easy to figure out what you're asking and it's, and it really is like, um, have, did you come in on budget on your, on previous projects? Have you, and, and if not, why, you know, and did you, did you finish on time? And if not, why? And what other projects have you done that have, a, you know, that might make you feel like this is a good, you know, that this would be a good fit for you. And I mean, what's the owner's phone number so you can call. And right. Right. <laughs> and, then, and then, yeah. And who ran that project? And can we talk to them? Like that kind of right. thing. Are we, are do we have a workshop on January 2nd, or is that possible to have a, because it would be nice to have a discussion, not mm -hmm. just a vote, but. Um, we don't have one scheduled, but I think that's a great idea. Okay. Um, and I would ask that you guys come as well. I'd also <coughs> remind you that we have on the 19th, the public forum, um, where the community is invited to come from six to seven to provide their thoughts on a consolidated or um, renovated options and we'll use that to formulate. And I do think that having that opportunity for us to talk about this is really valuable. And I also just want to point out that you may have noticed our um, slideshows slightly on the wordy side, but that's because um, we kind of made it so that this can be uh, shared. So it'll be up on our um, website, right? Yeah, it'll be up on our website. Um, and as a document that hopefully can stand alone and give people some information or at least the um, a start on where to uh, continue looking for information for for um, this project. Can that go on social media? <coughs> uh, we could link it. We could do a okay. link to it on that social media for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I don't. We can't put the entire slideshow on Thanks. like Instagram, but. <laughs> And, and all of those documents that you guys had mentioned that I know are in our share drive, have those all been linked to the website? So yeah. So the um, the enrollment study is public and the um, uh, master, master plan, plan, sorry, the master plan is also public. I mean, what we might want to do is m put another link to all those things under the building steering committee page. Um, yes, I mean, even though they're linked in other places, yeah. we might want to kind of put them all together. Them. I'm not yes, move please. them, but just addition, put an additional yeah. pathway for people to be able to find those things. That's great. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. This was incredibly informative. Yep. Um, thank you. Thank your families as well for <laughs> the amount of hours that you have spent with us in preparing for this. Thank you.
Thank you. It's good to get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody's fine with it as long as we miss bedtime. Uh, <laughs> all right, and with that, um, the workshop is concluded, and we have about a five minute recess until we move into our business session. Mm. Yeah, you should